So let me just pray. Thank you, God, for this beautiful time to open your word. And we're so grateful for scripture that guides us, teaches us, leads us to know you in all truth. And so we commit it to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. I do want to say before we dive in that I'm here all week and part of my joy is if any of you want to meet and talk, pray, discuss scripture, talk about the future, talk about coming to Scotland someday, uh, I'd be happy to do that. So please just say, hey Wes, I'd like to, to meet you and have a chat and that would be my great joy. Most of you do not know, but my wife and I Amongst other things in Scotland, I teach at a theological college, but the other half of our ministry is running a church for refugee people, all of them refugees from Muslim backgrounds, Muslim countries where they've been in, quite under serious oppression. And so in our church that's growing and just seeing lots of lovely fruit, many people turning to Christ, uh, in the past three months, we've had 32 people baptized, just beautiful, all from Muslim past, and now they've met Jesus and just are ardently wanting to follow that. But we periodically teach straightforwardly and honestly and objectively what we call Bible issues for Muslim background people. And as I've done this, I've had some of our own Western team members remark that this focus is needed just as much for all earnest Christians as it addresses critical areas of biblical teaching, biblical theology, that even most Christians are not really conversant in when you come down to it. And so I decided that this would be uh, good to give attention to during this Chamber Fest week together when we have such bright and inquisitive students as yourselves and even some staff and faculty who sit in from time to time. It might help us come back to some really important teachings of Scripture as we think of them in comparison and contrast with central truths coming out of the Muslim faith. The obvious place to begin, I think, is the Bible itself. Or another way to put it, as it relates to evangelical commitments to the authority of the scriptures, might be more memorable if we put it in a question form like this for these next few days. Why the Word? Why the Word of God? To tackle this thoroughly, we will look at one major passage in the Bible over the next few days, and it happens to be the theme verses for Chehi this year. It doesn't just happen to be. I kind of thought about that. <laughs> it would be a good occasion to do that. So we're going to begin this morning with this very important teaching about what does the Bible say about itself that we come to in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 17. Graham gave a wonderful introduction to that last night. So if you could turn to that in your Bibles right now, 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be fully capable, fully adequate, equipped for every good work. It is, of course, natural that in our context with Muslim background people in Glasgow, we need to frame questions about Bible issues, first of all, in the context of understanding the Quran, the sacred holy book of Islam. And to put this in contrast, I'm just going to give you a very brief cursory peek at issues around the Quran. 
for comparison's sake, as it urges us to understand our own Bibles more thoroughly. And as such, it becomes a very good conversation partner, if nothing else. To say nothing of the fact that Islam, as you may or may not know, is growing exponentially all around the world, and intelligent Christians should know more and more what is at stake. So we can talk about this honestly, lovingly, objectively, but with serious comparison, contrast, purpose. The term Quran simply means to read, or in literal Arabic translation, the Quran is the recitation, thus implying the recited words of God. These words of God, so Islam would call them, were first given to the Prophet Muhammad at the age of 40 in the year AD 610, 610. So about 563 years after the first writings of the New Testament in the Bible, and many, many years later than the Hebrew scriptures that we call the Old Testament in our Bibles. The Quran, is half the length of the New Testament and about one-fifth as long as the Old Testament. It contains what are called surat, something like we would turn chapters in the West. And there are 114 of them, 114 surat. And the Quran is organized neither chronologically nor even topically, but simply by the size and scope of each surat, from the largest down to the smallest, in just in terms of size. Probably the main distinctive about the Quran that concerns us today is that it is claimed to have been dictated verbatim by God to one man, the Prophet Muhammad, in Arabic, in Arabic only with the classical belief stating that it was sent down, they call it that, sent down, in its entirety in one night. Although Muhammad himself references that he received it piecemeal, bits and pieces, over a 22-year period. And so, now we turn to this passage in 2 Timothy, 3, 14 to 17, in order to begin to think about what the Bible says about itself in comparison and contrast with a major uh, com competing, we could say, faith called Islam. Let's uh, read it again. It's just the short passage. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from, the ch from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be fully adequate, capable, equipped for every good work. This morning, you will be so delighted to know we're only going to look at verse 16, just one verse, that confirms for us something very different from the Quran, as it tells us that all Scripture is inspired by God. Islam, you see, claims that the Quran was dictated by God to one man. The Bible affirms that it is inspired by God, and I want to suggest to you that the difference between something that is claimed to be dictated and something that claims to be inspired is really seriously significant. It is an adjective in Greek, theonoustos, and it means breathed into by God, inspired. Theonoustos, breathed into by God. And it carries the idea that God breathes life into words penned 
by human authors. God breathes life into the very words that make up our Bibles, our scripture. Meaning that God does not dictate in some heavenly approved language, one language, Arabic, but rather he inspires human authorship. And do you grapple with me the significance of that? Taking into account their different languages, their different cultures, their different times in history, their different geographical settings across the whole span of all that we have in the Bible. Inspiration is not dictation. It honors language. It honors cultures. It honors artistic sensibilities like music making <coughs> and visual art and dance and drama. It honors historical times and geography as the means God uses to communicate his truths to us that is his word to us. Why the word? While dictation simply ignores these as all irrelevant, it's actually, that's what Islam teaches. Culture, time, history, cult, uh, art, languages, races are all irrelevant. and entrusts its claim to one single man who this classical <coughs> idea says he received it in one night. He himself said it was over a 22-year period. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Claiming divine dictation is very different from claiming divine inspiration. And this is why the superlative in verse 16 is so important in how the Bible understands itself. What is the superlative in verse 16? All. All scripture is inspired by God because it is setting the parameters on the one hand of all in the sense of all these different aspects of multiple human authorship honoring their diverse cultural contributions that we've already mentioned celebrating diverse races celebrating diverse languages celebrating diverse com customs celebrating diverse times and places and diverse approaches to artistic expression that help us grapple with God's word. But it is also, on the other hand, <coughs> all, the superlative, all scripture, in the sense of all of the Bible. So that we are not at liberty to pick some parts of the Bible that we kind of like and not pay attention to the bits that are too hard. That is a prevailing problem in most of the kind of backgrounds we all come from, where we really honor the authority of Scripture, but only the parts we like. And at best, not pay attention to the others, and at worst, cut them out of the Bible and say they don't belong there. We cannot discard some parts of the Bible that we do not like, as though we are in charge and we can determine what suits us best. When we understand what the Bible says about itself, this word all, this superlative, is hugely important. All of God's ways of bringing his word and all of the Bible. 
including the parts you don't like, the parts that make you squirm, the parts that you say, I don't get that. And I don't like that. I hear it too often amongst kind of Christians that have kind of gotten bur burnt and angry and frustrated. Things like, well, that bit in the Bible there is obviously inspired because I like it. It's beautiful. But I don't like that bit. It's obviously not inspired. It's too hard. It's caustic, it hits you in the face, it doesn't let you out of dealing with some hard truth. No, no, not at all. Rather, the text here, in which it is happily helping us to grapple with what the Bible says about itself, says it as clear as can be. All Scripture. All Scripture is inspired by God. I so love that this is what the Bible teaches about itself. Because it means that as I learn about a diverse culture and how God used that to bring truth, how God uses a different language group, a different race, a different time, a different perspective, and different artistic expressions that bring God's truths alive, God himself honors that. Now, there is so much more in this passage in 2 Timothy to go over, but we're going to reserve that for the next few days. This morning I want to conclude by reminding us that the scripture that is referred to here is directly related to what is meant when the Bible talks about the Word of God. Even as we consider the hugely important question, why the Word? In the Bible itself, we can conceive of the Word of God, I think, in three important ways. One, the broad Word of the Lord in which God, in the context of the prophets, spoke his word in the very specific situations wherein we read of the prophets often saying, the word of the Lord came to me. Second, of course, is the written word of God by which the Bible itself means the Bible itself or scripture, such as we have studied in this passage this morning. But third, the Bible teaches us that the word of God communicates with us and comes to us in a person, which is why Jesus Christ is called the Word made flesh. And I believe with all my heart we need all of those. We need the Word of God in a moment specifically where the truth from God speaks to us. We need the scriptures, and we need it all to point to a person, Jesus himself. But the centrality of the word of God is scripture, even as it is literally center place in this explanation from 2 Timothy, is paramount and even somewhat obvious. Because all that we know about the word of the <clears throat> Lord through the prophets and Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, depends on the study of, the commitment to, and trust in this, the Bible. That's where it comes from. So why the Word? Don't take it for granted. Don't sit in churches and just say, okay, yeah, of course, preaching the Bible. Why the Word? Hopefully throughout this week you will gain reasons and assurances, confidence, in fact, as to why your Bible is so important. 
When you put it in contrast with something like the Quran, it just becomes so obvious. That's not dissing anybody, that's just an objective comparison. And that's kind of the world we live in, my wife and I. And it offers us the opportunity ourselves to say, what do we believe about central Christian truths? This one today and tomorrow and the next day, why the word? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for the word of God. <clears throat> the word spoken like prophets, the word of the Lord came to me. We pray for experiences like that. The written word, the revelation, and the inspiration of human authors. And of course, it all pointing to the word made flesh. Thank you so much for these students and faculty and staff that are all working together to bring, as Uncle Wilmus, Wilmus would say, faith and learning, faith and music, Jesus Christ, and the beauty of the music that extols the creator of all. We pray in the name of Jesus, Pray that each student, as they begin into these chamber groups, would sense your presence. Give their coaches, the faculty coaches, real wisdom and guidance, and all of the counselors as they speak to them, share their lives. We commit them into your good care. In the name of Jesus, amen. Again, let me reiterate, I would be so overjoyed if somebody wants to talk to me. All you have to do is say, I'll buy you a cup of coffee. <laughs> and you're on. <laughs>